Okay, so let's uh, try opening up our textbook again. So our textbook's on our desktop here. And we were on the next section, which was operators and expressions. So let's open up a um, terminal here. And let's go into the interpreter by typing Python 3. OK. And basically, like you can use Python like a calculator, so you can add numbers. Um, now, usually in a program with Genie, we wouldn't do that. Like I said, the interpreter will automatically put the output, will show you the output. But in Genie, you'd have to store it somehow. So um, you could say something like x equals 3 plus 3. So that's the difference uh, between those two. When you're typing in Genie, you're not going to see the result right away. You're going to have to run the program. And also, when you run this program, you're not going to see anything. So notice, if I just type this and I run this program, if I hit F5, and let's call it, uh, let's call it, or how about let's call it uh, testing.py. Remember, it always has to end in a py. Notice, I don't get any output, nothing. Whereas here, if I just execute things in the interpreter line by line, then I actually can see the output. So the interpreter is not really for making programs. It's just for testing stuff. Now, you can store stuff here, but that's still not going to show it to you. You're going to have to print in order to see the output. Okay? So, but let's go back here and let's go to the textbook here. So we can add, we can subtract, we can multiply. And remember, multiply is a star, not an x. Okay, that's very important. Powers. So, for example, 2 to the power of 3 is. That's not multiplying. That's 2 times 2 times 2 to the power of. Okay, That's an important one to remember. Very, very handy. You can also, by the way, you can also use to the power of to take the square root of something. So for example, what's the square root of 16? So you can say to the power of, do you guys know how to take the square root of something? What is it to the power of? Okay, so if you do to the power of one half, that's like taking the square root. That's actually useful sometimes as well. So in this case, we can take a square root without importing any math libraries. Uh, division, now this is actually different in Python 3 versus, versus Python 2. We're not going to learn Python 2, but I just want you to be cognizant of it in case you one day have to look at Python 2 code. If I do this, okay, in Python 3, it actually divides it like a calculator would. But in Python 2, that's not what the answer would be. The answer actually would be different. Uh, I don't want to tell you what the answer is because it's, I think it's going to confuse you. But I just want you to know Python 3 is the way forward. And, um, well, I'll just tell you, the answer actually would be 0 uh, for with Python 2. And if I did this, if I did 4 divided by 3, the answer would be 1 in Python 2. But they changed it to be this way. Um, by the way, this is also true for other languages, like, for example, uh, C and C++. 
If you have integer, so integer divided by integer, the answer is going to be an integer. But in this case, we're going integer divided by integer, and the answer is becoming a floating point number. Notice the difference. So the 4 is an integer, the 3 is an integer, and yet our answer is not an integer. It's a floating point number. So that's why Python 2 was different. Now, I'll even show it to you. I know this is kind of weird, but like, watch. If I go into Python 2, notice here it says 3. Notice here it says 2, because I didn't put a 3 after the word Python here. So if I go 4 divided by 3, the answer is 1. Notice here, I go 4 divided by 3, the answer is a floating point number. So this is consistent with other languages, like C++ and C, but this is changed in Python 3. Do you have to know this? No. We're not going to learn Python 2. So let's close that. Bye-bye, Python 2. Um, now, um, yeah, we can do division. But sometimes, listen, sometimes you do want that other behavior, what's called floor division. You do want floor division. So let's try floor division. Let's go for floor division 3. And that gives us 1. OK? Let's try going 2 floor division 3. And that also gives you, well, it, sorry, didn't do floor division there. I only did 1. That gives you 0. So, in essence, um, what's happening here is you could consider it as dropping the uh, decimal point here. But it's a little bit more complicated than that. And I'll show you what I mean when I give uh, you an example of a negative number. In a yeah. OK, we're back. And. Um, So let's see, where were we? Right, yeah, we we're going to do some floor division with negative numbers. OK, so because I, I don't want you to think, see, like, if I was to, um, let me open an editor here. Or let's, just go to, let's just go to Genie here. And let me show you here. Let me write, like, put a number line in, OK? How about this? 3, 2, 1, 0, negative 1. Negative 2, negative 3. OK, that's the number line. Can you see that number line? So let's go back here and let's try something where, so like basically, here, here, here let's go back to this. What, what, is, what is 2 divided by 3? It's 0. 0.6 repeating, right? So where would that fit in the number line? Where is 0. 0.6 repeating? Yeah, it's between these two numbers here. So floor division means, Okay, look at this classroom right now, right? Where's the floor? Point to the floor. Okay, where's the ceiling? See the difference? Okay, so let's just think that this is a building. Let's say it's a building. You with me? Now, if the answer is 0.6, that means we're right here on the floor between 0 and 1, right? Now, if you're on that floor, where's... If you where is what number is the floor? Zero. If you're standing right here, if if this is let's say I'm I'm gonna say that's a person right there. The ampersand is the person. Where is what's the floor they're standing on? Zero. You get it? So therefore, two divide two floor division three is gonna give you zero. You with me? Okay. But now let's go back here. You're gonna see something funny is gonna happen. What if I did negative 3 floor division 4? What? It's not giving me 0. OK, first of all, let's think about this for a sec. What if I did the division, negative 3 divided by 4? What's the answer? Negative 0.75, right? OK, let's go back to our building. Where is, where is negative 0.75? Isn't it right there? It's right there, right? Okay, where? what's the floor that they're standing on? 
negative 1. And to do tada, now you understand floor division. You get it? So, so if I did positive 3 divided by 4, floor division, that's going to give me 0 because it's going to be positive 0.75. And the floor there is 0. But because it's a negative number, the floor is 1 below. Do you get it? OK, so one more test to see if you truly understand this. OK, what if I did negative 4 floor division 3? What's that going to give me? Make a prediction. You don't wait for me to hit enter. Make a prediction. Think about it in your head. Were you right? Think about this. If you go like, the, oops, sorry, messed up there. Let's try that again. If you, if you just divide them normally, you get negative 1 and 1 third. Now if you go to the building, negative 1 and 1 third is on that floor right there. So therefore, you're standing on negative 2. That's the floor. Okay? So now you understand how floor division works. This is important. You might think to yourself, Mr. Art, why would we have to learn floor division? It seems like a weird and esoteric, but honestly, in programming, it can come in very handy. You'll see later on in this course that we're going to be using it later. Okay? It's a it's one of the it's one of your tools that you need, honestly. Okay, uh, let's go back. So we've done floor division, and um, as they say, round the answer down to the nearest back in a float. Oh my god! Here we are. We're at the most important thing we're going to learn today. Modulo. Modulus. Holy smokes, this is important. Okay. So, um, let's try something like 10. And I, I'm not always going to say modulo because it's, it's too many syllables. I'm just going to say 10 mod 2. Okay, watch this. The answer is zero. So what is this? Well, if you think about a, a doing a division, if you go um, 10 divided by 2, okay, how many times does 2 go into 10? Well, it goes in five times. Does it go in exactly? Yeah. Does it go in perfectly? Is there a remainder? Do you guys know what a remainder is? So let's try this. Let's try going 11 divided by 2. What's the remainder? Now in this case, don't say 0.5. Okay? So in other words, think of it this way. 2 will go into 10 perfectly 5 times. What's left over from 10 to 11? How, one. 1 is left over, right? So watch this. If I go 11 mod, oops, messed up. If I go 11 mod 2, the answer is 1. So basically what it's doing is it's doing the division, and then it's figuring out what the remainder is. This is such an important feature of programming. This is used in so many different areas. OK? Um, it's odd because, you know, you don't actually learn this very much in regular mathematics. But in computer science, boy, is it ever important. So let's try something else. Let me try here. Let's see if you guys can figure out what the answer is to this before I hit enter. What's 15 mod 3? Everyone got an answer in their head? Does 3 go perfectly into 15? How many times? Five times. And there's no remainder. The answer is 0. OK? What if I did this? What if I went 4? 
How many times does 4 go into 15? Does it, does it go, does, does 4 go into 15 four times? No. No, it doesn't, right? Because that would be 16. So it goes in three times. So what's 3 times 4? 12. 12. And what's left over between 12 and 15? 30. See? The answer is 3. Do you now understand how mod works, modulo? Well, you think you do, but there's a little bit more to it. Um, so now, all these situations are where the second number is smaller than the first number. So let me ask you this: What if we make the numbers? What if we make both of the numbers quite small? So. Um, for example, what would, let's say, 3 mod 3 be? How many times does 3 go into 3? Yeah, and no remainder, right? Okay, so I know you probably got that right, because there's no remainder. But here's one you might not know what the answer to it is. What's 2 mod 3? Now I know what you're thinking. Wait, Mr. Ark, uh, the answer to that, well, I think it's zero because three doesn't go into two. But you're wrong. Three does go into two. Do you know how many times? Not once, but what's below one? Zero. zero. Three goes into two zero times. No, not three left over. Close, close. What's the difference between zero and two? Ready? I'm going to hit enter. You see that? Do you understand what the logic is behind that? I mean, think about what we did before, right? Think about this one. How many times does four go into 15? Three times. That's 12. And so what's the difference between 12 and 15? 3. Okay, now you get that one. So use the same logic. How many times does 3 go into 2? 0 times. And now what's the difference? How many, how many numbers are left over? Right? Because 0 times 3 is 0. Now what's the difference between 0 and 2? 2. So in fact, Here's the cool thing. Whenever the first number is bigger than the second number in a mod, so let's try it. Let's say, for, for example, let's go something like 4 mod uh, 9. How many times does 9 go into 4? Zero times. What's left over? Do you understand now what's happening here? So let me do something ridiculous. What's 123 mod uh, 5,555? What do you think the answer is going to be? You get it? Whenever, so here's, so you can basically take this as a steadfast rule. Whenever the second number in the mod is bigger than the first number, the answer is the first number. Make sense? You better put that in your notes, okay? So, or at least understand how mod works, what, why it's doing that. So, um, okay, so what have we dealt with? We've dealt with numbers that are bigger in the first number, and we've dealt with numbers that are uh, bigger in the second number. Um, now, when you're doing mod, okay, uh, I don't think you can do decimal places. I don't think you can do floats with mod. It's not going to work. Oh my god, it works. Ooh. Okay, I'll be honest with you. I have no clue what that means. I'd have to look that up. Um, does that... Does that also work in Python too? I don't even know. I've never used mod with decimals. 
learn something new every day. Um, I actually can't tell you what that, what the meaning behind that is. So I'm going to leave that. I might look it up later and talk about it in a future lesson, but I don't. I've never used decimal place. I just thought I'd try it. Um, there is another type of situation that um, that we we need to kind of look at, and that is um, negative numbers with mod. But I don't know if I want to introduce this to you right now. Um, we might do that later because I think that's enough for you to digest for, with for modulus at this point. Um, yeah, we'll come back to we'll come back to negative numbers and modulus at another time. Um, but for now, let's just move on a little bit because I don't want to overwhelm you. We're going to skip left shift for now, and we're going to skip right shift. We're going to skip bitwise operators, bitwise or and uh, all those. But we're going to come to less than. Okay. Do you remember last period? Did I show you guys the Boolean data type? Yes. Do you guys remember the Boolean data type? So let's just go over it again. If I say something like x equals true. Now x is a Boolean data type, and x would be true. I can say I can also make something uh, false by using a capital F. And now y is a Boolean data type, and y is false. Okay, those are the only two values a Boolean data type can have: is true or false. But when you do a when you use a, a relational operator like less than or greater than it returns a Boolean value. So for example, if I say, is 3 less than 4? Answer, true. Look at that. So that's returning a Boolean value. So, so for example, if I did something like this, if I did something like um, answer equals uh, 4 greater than 3, what do you think answer is equal to? True or false? Is 4 greater than 3? Come on. True. So therefore, answer is true. So that's what a relational operator does, is it compares the two things. And so what do we have? Well, we have less than. We've got greater than. And we've got less than or equal to. So now in this case, so we could say, how about is 4 less than, or how about this? Let's say, is 3 less than 3? False. 3 is not less than 3. Now let's go, is 3 less than or equal to 3? Yeah, it's equal to 3. 3 is equal to 3. So it's like you're comparing not just if it's less than, but also it could be equal to, and it'll still be true. Does that make sense? There's also greater than or equal to. Okay? But here's the weird one. We cannot do this. Okay? We cannot say, it does 3 equal 3? That's a syntax error. That doesn't work. So in math, when you're in math class, you can use 1 equal to. But do you know what 1 equal to in computer science is? It means assignment. It's not a, it's not a comparison operator. It's not a comparison operator. One equal to is not a comparison. So in other words, watch how I use one equal to. If I say x equals 3, that's called an assignment. I am assigning the value of 3 to the variable x. Okay. So how do I compare? So I could say y equals 3. Now I want to compare x and y. Ready? I do not go like this. What that's doing is it's assigning the value of y to x. That's not what I want to do. I want to compare them. I want to ask the question, does y and x, are they equal? Yes, they are. True. So if I changed y to be 4, okay, and now x is still 3, and y is 4, and I could say 
does x equal y? No, they're not equal. You get it? So I want you to put this in your notes. This is a super important concept. And a lot of students who are beginning in programming fail at this. Ready? And I'll just write notes here. So is assignment. OK? Hashtag means it's a comment, right? So nothing's going to execute. Is a comparison. which returns Boolean. So when you want to compare two things, you have to use equals equals. You guys get it? All right. Um, then there's not equal to. Okay. So basically, what was x again? What's y again? So if I say, is x not equal to y? Yes, x is not equal to y. That's true. One of them is 3, one of them is 4. What if I made um, y equal to 3? Now they're both equal, right? Now, is x not equal to y? False. They are equal. Do you understand the logic there? Okay, so then we have the not operator. Okay, ready? Watch this. I could say something like, let's make, um, what's x here? x and y, they're both equal, right? Let's make y equal to 4 again. Okay, and let's say, does, is x equal to y? False. Okay, or I could say I could make it even simpler. Does three equal four? False. Ready? Watch what I can do to the answer now. I can go not bracket three equals four, and the answer gets inverted. It basically changes it from whatever it is to the other one. It's like flipping a switch. The answer is now true. So I'm saying, it's like, it's like saying, does 3 equal 4? No. False. But now not. Flip the answer. So if your answer is false, you have to flip it to true. Make sense? Um, and then there is and and or. Boy, oh boy. All right, let's do and and or. Now we're going to get into compound statements. So we could say, is 3 equal to 4 and uh, 4 equal to 4? Now let's think about what the two answers are here. Ready? Now before we go into this, what, before I show you this, actually, I'm kind of teaching this the wrong way. Let's try this. Let's go true and true. What does that give me? Let's try false and false. That gives me false. Let's try true and false. That gives me false. Let's try false. Oops and true. That gives me false. So how many possibilities are there? One, two, three, four. Are there any other possibilities? No, that's it. Okay. So if, since it's only um, two values, true or false, those are the only things we could do with and. Notice the only one that's true is the first one, which is if both are true. And that makes sense in English, too. You know why? Because when you're talking to someone, let's say I said to you, I want you to buy the apple. 
if it is fresh and red. So if you find a fresh green apple, would you buy it? Okay. If you find a rotten red apple, would you buy it? So both things have to be true because I use the word and. I, if I said to you, buy the apple which is red and fresh. Get it? They both have to be true or you're not going to buy it. That, I've, I've specified that. But what if I said to you, buy the apple that is fresh or red? Now, as long as one of those two things is true, you can buy the apple, right? Well, guess what? Now let's take a look at how or works. Ready? True or false is true. True or true is also true. What about false or true? Oops, that's also true. And now lastly, what about false or false? That one's false. Notice there was only one, for the and, there was only one that was true. But for the or, all of them are true except for one. You see what I mean? So in other words, watch this. Now instead of actually just putting false or true, so like let's go back to the apple example. If I said buy an apple that is red or fresh. Let's say you find a fresh green apple. Would you buy it? Yeah, because I said or. What if you find an apple that's red but rotten? Would you buy it? Yeah, because that's what I said. I said buy a, an apple that is red or fresh. I didn't say they both had to be true. Only one of them has to be true for the whole thing to be true. You, you understand the concept, right? So now let's take it one step further and let's say, okay, well, what about if we did something like uh, 3 equals 4 or 2 equals 2. Is that whole thing going to be true or false? Think about, d dissect it down into pieces. Is the first part true or false? Okay. And now is the second part true or false? True. So how many of them have to be true in order for the whole thing to be true when you have an or? Yeah. So is the whole thing true or false? There you go. You got it. Do you understand how this logic works? This is logic. Okay? I can make this more difficult. Ready? What if I did something like this? Um, two, or how about, let's, let's try something different. How about five equals five and not 4 equals 5. Is that true or false, the whole thing? True. Don't, don't just look at it and go, I think I'm going to take a guess. Figure out the answer to the first part, figure out the answer to the second part, and then notice how they're connected with the and. I'll give you a sec. Look at it and then make your prediction. And the answer is true. Why? Well, because 5 equals 5 is true. Now, with an and, they both have to be true for the whole thing to be true. That means this has to be true as well. But is 4 equal to 5? No, that's false. But if we put a not in front, then it becomes true. So therefore, it's true and true. And we know that in that situation, and is going to be true. Make sense? So that's how you use and and or. Okay? 
So we could do, let's say, one more with an or. Let's say we went um, something like, I could even make it a little bit more complicated. 4 equals uh, 6 minus 2 or now those of you that are smart already know the answer do you know why because it doesn't matter what I put what I type after this I could even just be silly and type in false what do you think the answer is going to be right because it's an or so that means as long as one of the two is true and you know that 6 minus 2 is 4 and that means 4 equals 4, the whole, the whole thing is now going to be true. Do you get it? So, um, well, that's kind of all I want to do with and and or right now. Uh, so we went through everything. Um, Shortcut operators. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, so let's do this one now. So for shortcut operators, um, we've got things like, for example, if I say x equals x plus 1. Okay, so we don't even know what x is at this point. Let's see what x is. x is 3. x equals x plus 1. After executing this line, what do you think the value of x is? Four. Okay. So we're gonna. The way this is gonna work is we're gonna replace. We. By the way, just a just a piece of trivia here. If you show this to a math to a math teacher, they start freaking out because they say, "No, no, 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 no. This can never be true. That's wrong. You wrote some wrong algebra there, son. Nope." Nope, don't want to see that. X, they'll, they'll mark it wrong. <laughs> Funny thing is they'll mark it wrong with an X. That's kind of weird. Anyways, my point is, is that math teachers confuse this with this. They're looking at that equal sign like it's, a, like it's an e equality. That's not what it is. It's an assignment. So I'm assigning x plus 1 to the new value of x. So in order for, for me to evaluate this, I'd have to figure out what the current value of x is. It's a 3. And so I'd go 3 plus 1. And so now the new value of x is a 4. Ta-da. OK? But there is a shortcut method to do this. And the answer is x plus equals 1. Now if I did that, it's just like saying x equals x plus 1. And when I look at the value of x now, it's going to be one more, which is 5. Do you guys, do you guys understand the concept? So I don't I, I do not, I, you know, I'll tell you this. I'm not going to promote you. I'm not going to promote you to do this right now. Um, but I'm going to say right now, I want you just to be aware of it, but I'd prefer that you use this because you guys are all beginners. Okay? So that by that shortcut also works for multiplication and it works for other things too. So for like for example multiplication, if, if x is 5 and I go x equals uh, x times 2. And by the way, the order of multiplication or addition doesn't matter, so I can also go 2 times x. Right? So x is now going to be 10. I can I can do that again by saying x times equals 2. And so in this case, what's 2 times 10? It's 20. OK? But like I said, I just want you to be aware of this, but I don't want you to use it right now. I want you to use this method. Because it's it, when you look at it, it's easier to understand. 
right now. Order of evaluation. So, um, you've probably heard of bed mass in. Um, what does bed mass stand for in math? Do you guys remember? Brackets, exponents. Yeah, division, multiplication, addition, and subtraction. So uh, that's the same order in which uh, things work in Python. Um, important thing to remember is you'll, you'll have to use brackets like I did here um, in order to specify things like, for example, I'll give you an example. How about let's go three times. Uh, 5 minus 2. Okay, what's the answer? 9. Nine. What if I did not use the brackets? 3 times 5 is 15, minus 2 is, tw is 13. Right? So, in certain t cases, you'll have to use brackets to. Um, and here, they say the following table taken from Python reference model is. Provided for sake of completeness, it is far better to use parentheses to group operators and operands appropriately in order to explicitly specify the, the precedence. Okay? So, this says the following table gives the precedence uh, table for Python. Listen, I, I don't want you guys to be kind of think you're really being, being cool by ordering things in a specific way. When in doubt, when you want to be clear, use brackets. It's much easier to read, and it makes things more understandable for everyone, including yourself. OK? Um, changing the order of operations. OK, I just did that with you. And there's another example. Um, Yeah. Yeah, it's this is important too. It says do not overdo it. So in other words, um, don't do redundant things. Like if you're going three times four, and obviously you know that's going to happen, right? Before the plus, then you don't need the brackets in that situation. Um, yeah, associativity. I don't think you need the brackets in this situation either. This would be overdoing it. Expressions. Aha! Now we can write formulas. Okay? So let's take a look at that. So if I... Here, let's grab the textbook and put it over here. So if I was to write an expression, let's say, let's say for example, if I went width equals 4, and let's say I went height equals 6, then I said area equals width times height. Now, what's my area? 24, 6 times 4. Okay? And then, of course, I could also, like the, like the example they have in there, you could also calculate the perimeter. If you know how to do math, you'd have to add the width and the height, or in this case, they're using le length and breadth, and then multiply it by 2. Right? So in this case, I didn't print anything out, but I could. Okay? And I could even print something like this. I could even say something like this with an F string. I could say if the height is height, 
I don't know why I chose such a long variable name. I should have just said H and W. Much better, right? Let's fix this. Here, let's go W equals 4 and H equals 6. Done. Now, I'll say print. Okay. Um, and then I could say area equals width times height. Now I'll go print f string. And I could do something simple like the area is A. You guys do this too. Type it up. Okay? So there you go. By the way, you could put an expression in the in the in the curly braces as well. I could actually have done this as well. But then my answer is not stored anywhere. Okay, so we're finished uh, this section. And so um, that's going to be the end of our uh, lesson today. But what I'd like you to do is right now, I would like you to go on the internet and find the equation. Find the mathematical equation for changing Fahrenheit to Celsius. Okay? And what I want you to do is I want you to go like this. I want you to say, you could just use F for Fahrenheit, let's say. And I want you to try and go, if the Fahrenheit is 100, 100 degrees Fahrenheit. I want you to calculate what the Celsius is. Okay? So you're not going to go, I mean, once you calculate what C is equal to in terms of a formula, so you're going to figure out, okay, what's the formula for, cel for Celsius if I know the Fahrenheit? Once you figure out that formula for the internet, plug it in, execute it, and then once you're done, say print 100 degrees Fahrenheit is equal to blank degrees Celsius. Okay? Um, you can actually, I'd probably prefer you to do this in Genie. Okay? So I want you to do this in Genie. Um, call the file like something like temperature.py. And the, I'll give you the first line. There's the first line. Okay? And I want you to calculate and I want you to print out. When you run the program, it'll actually print 100 degrees Fahrenheit is equal to something degrees Celsius. Okay? Good luck. Um, we'll see you next time.